like to share with you the closing keynote, a U.S. government and private sector discussion on ICT Cyber SCRM. My name is Joyce Hunter, and I'm the Executive Director of the Institute for Critical Infrastructure Technology. In its recently released report, the U.S. Cyberspace Solarium Commission expanded on the government's Defend Forward strategy as part of its objective to establish a layered cyber deterrence strategy for the United States. The Commission's recommendations expand on this strategy and describe an approach that would employ all instruments of power to proactively shape the international digital environment, disrupt and defeat ongoing malicious adversary cyber campaigns, and reinforce favorable international norms of behavior with the overall objective of achieving stability as defined by U.S. interests. The Commission believes that a robust partnership between the private and public sectors is a needed ingredient to implement Defend Forward effectively. In this session, the Executive Director of Cyberspace Solarium Commission and the Executive Vice President for Policy at the Information Technology Industry Council will discuss the interaction of public and private sectors. Our speakers will discuss the similarities and differences between the two groups and how public and private sector organizations can partner moving forward. First, I'd like to introduce Rear Admiral Mark Montgomery. He serves as the Executive Director of the Cyberspace Solarium Commission. Mark Montgomery also serves as Senior Director of the Center on Cyber and Technology Innovation at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. He previously served as Policy Director for the Senate Armed Services Committee under the leadership of Sen the late Senator John McCain. Mark also previously served for 32 years in the United States Navy as a nuclear trained surface warfare officer retiring as a rear admiral in 2017. Our next panelist is Mr. Rob Strayer. He serves as the Executive Vice President of Policy at the Information Technology Industry Council, ITI. He leads ITI's efforts to shape technology policy around the globe, representing 75 of the most innovative tech companies. Prior to joining ITI, Strayer served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Cyber and International Communications Policy at the United States Department. In that role, he led dozens of engagements with foreign governments on digital economy and cybersecurity issues. Welcome, gentlemen. I'll turn it over to your Admiral Montgomery. Well, thank you very much, uh, Joyce, and it's a real honor to be here with Rob on the panel. Um, you know, you hit on it right in, in the initial introdu introduction. The U.S. Cyberspace Solarium Commission, in its March 2020 report, did call on the U.S. government to take steps to reduce our critical dependencies on untrusted information and communications technology, or ICTs. This was one of 82 recommendations in a broad report that was, that was tailored to um, to identify the appropriate strategic approach that the United States needs to take to protect our critical infrastructure and the policy and legislative remedies necessary to, uh, to implement that strategic approach. But among those 82, this recommendation on a, uh, on a US government strategy to reduce our critical dependencies was one of our most critical recommendations. So in addition to the specific recommendation, um, we had uh, affiliated recommendations to improve intelligence and information sharing, sharing around supply chain risks. And, uh, and core to the commission's recommendation approach was this idea of an ICT industrial-based strategy. We really wanted to ensure a more trusted supply chain and the availability of critical ITC technologies during a crisis. We went on to produce a white paper that, uh, that laid out the commission's efforts uh, to further the recommendation. And, and explain what the risk was. And, and I'll just put it bluntly. In the context of supply chains for ICT, the United States has a China problem. Over the past two decades, China has mobilized state-owned and state-influenced companies to grab a dominant position in markets for several emerging technologies, including the market for telecommunications equipment. 
Uh, this isn't an accident, but it's the result of a concerted strategic effort by the Chinese government to capture these markets through a mix of both legal and illegal government-led industrial policies. Uh, some of these include uh, unfair decept and deceptive trade practices, how they do joint ventures with companies and how they blackmail companies once, they're, once they have a footprint in China to share their intellectual property. But it also included state-led intellectual property theft in, on, in, on servers inside the United States. It includes the manipulation of international standards and trade bodies to advocate for a, a approaches that benefit Chinese national champions and that certainly work to uh, favor uh, you know, sovereign state rights um, and, and to uh, push away for our, our lead away from norms and standards that were based on transparency, rule of law, and uh, uh, privacy rights and the rights of the individual. China also has used its growing network of influence built on the back of diplomatic and trade negotiations, things like the Belt and Road Initiative and the Silk Road, uh, Digital, Silk Road Digital Silk Road. And, it, and I will say, in what is a completely legal method, they've significantly increased their investments in research and development in ICT over the last two decades. So as a result of all that, the critical strategic competition between China and the United States and the United States allies and partners is taking place in an international system of commerce that due to this Chinese state intervention is neither free nor fair. And it hampers the ability of America, American and, uh, and allied companies, companies owned by uh, our allies to compete for global market share. And uh, you know, when you look at it, our primary competitor in this space, again, China, they have a comprehensive strategy. It's demonstrated in their Made in China 2025 and the civil military fusion project even in this China Standards 2035 that's now coming out. And by comparison, the United States has lacked an overarching vision for how to compete with China on this front. You could probably extend that discussion to many fronts with China, but particularly on this front. And, and what's confusing people is that there is a myriad of activity going on, good activity, both in the executive branch uh, under the previous administration and probably under this administration, and definitely within Congress. So you have congressional proposals like the American Foundries Act, the, uh, the CHIPS Act, the U.S. Telecom Act. Um, uh, and then you have executive branch initiatives run out of DHS, State, Department of Defense, Commerce, uh, Energy. Um, what we lacked was a coherent and comprehensive national strategy to align these efforts in partnership. Uh, partnership among between the executive and legislative branch partnership with the private sector and partnership with key allies. That doesn't mean that there weren't individual areas where that partnership occurred, I, I acknowledge that. But what we really need is a strategic umbrella that says, look, here are our lines of effort and here's the prioritization. I, I really think that's true with the congressional proposals because many of them had significant financial appropriations um, bills tacked to them. Now, most of that appropriations was stripped out last year, but I suspect this year, that uh, Senator Schumer, at least on the Senate side, is going to bring forth a pretty significant act. And it'll be in the guise of a China act, but it'll have a lot of ITC strategic lines of effort in it. But if that isn't properly put in the context of a strategic approach with prioritization, there's a good chance that in our eagerness to do something about a really apparent challenge, the U.S. will leap into action without a plan. The commission proposed that any strategy to secure the United States high tech supply chains must be built on a foundation of strong partnership with industry at home and abroad, as well as partner and allied governments. It has to rest on five key pillars. First, it has to identify key materials, components, and finished products that are critical to the national economic security of the United States through a risk-based approach. In other words, first, what are we trying to protect? I still, I'm gonna buy my kids sneakers from China. I think that goes without saying. I, I'm probably not going to buy microchips that go inside long-range anti-ship cruise missiles. Second, we have to leverage all the instruments of both ourselves and our allies and partners' investments to identify what's the minimum viable manufacturing capacity we have and our allies and partners have, and then fill the gaps in on what doesn't exist there. So once you determine what's critical, how much of what's critical can you get done? Third, we have, to we have to leverage kind of the existing and new efforts to provide greater government support 
through intelligence and information sharing, through things like penetration testing, device testing, and financial assistance to ensure that our supply chains are protected from compromise. In other words, that's increased in sharing of intelligence information and security assistance to ensure that the companies are protected. And finally, we'll have to facilitate domestic market development for finished technologies in the United States. And then we'll have to ensure that if we take all these steps, that the United States is, uh, that are, and our companies are operating in a, in, a, in a competitive level playing field. And that's pushing back on all the earlier Chinese efforts. So we think if we took those five steps, prioritize your lines of effort, we'll be in a good position uh, to compete and to protect your, your supply chain for ITC in the long term. Uh, I know there's a long answer, Joyce, or a long discussion of this, but I appreciate the opportunity to lay it out. Thank you very much, Mr. Montgomery. Rob, what are your thoughts? Joyce, thank you so much for that introduction, and uh, it's great to be here uh, with all everyone in the audience, the virtual audience today, and I also want to extend my appreciation to the Institute for Critical uh, Infrastructure Technology. It's always a pleasure to share uh, any space with uh, Mark Montgomery, even if uh, it's a virtual one. Um, you know, the work that uh, Mark and his team did to produce the Solarium Commission report is just tremendous. I mean, it's hard to imagine a uh, commission that's had more impact, uh, aside from maybe the 9-11 Commission over time on the form of legislation and shaping the cybersecurity policy debate. Uh, and I think that's also a testament to their co-chairs and uh, Senator King and Congressman Mike Gallagher from uh, Wisconsin. Um, as uh, ITI is a, a group of industry leaders uh, thinking about security, uh, you know, we look forward to working with the Solarium Commission in the future on those initiatives that uh, Mark just laid out. Today, I'd like to spend just a few minutes talking about the trend that uh, I see in the area of uh, supply chain. Uh, and over time, our, the general trend line in our understanding of supply chain security has become far much more rich and nuanced and comprehensive. Uh, there's many more points of data points that we include in the analysis that we do of, of uh, looking at uh, secure vendors and what it means to be secure. And because we're needing to go after so much more data, we need to be very thorough in including uh, many sources for that information, which include, of course, the private sector, but also the government. So the case for government private sector collaboration continues to grow because of the amount of uh, inputs that need to go into the consideration of uh, uh, supply chain uh, supply, supply chain practices. Um, for some time, we've been developing international standards and best practices uh, on supply chain security. And those have occurred through groups like the Enduring Security Framework and through the DHS's uh, Supply Chain Risk Management Task Force and through many others. Uh, and you know, those boil down to largely, you know seven areas of uh, important areas where there's you know, need for security, the more technical areas as range from secure design for hardware and software, physical security, uh, personnel security, uh, looking at the information systems and the cybersecurity of those within a company, and then looking at the potential for there to be counterfeits and, and detecting a tamper of uh, authentic uh, components. And of course, very importantly to that is looking at the other vendors in the supply chain that supply to an ultimate supplier. Uh, that's a very comprehensive analysis needs to take place. Um, the, most recently, the DHS Supply Chain Risk Management Task Force developed a vendor template to look at the many facets of, of the supply chain to analyze risk. Uh, within these many templates, there's two, I think, very much emerging criteria that sort of stand out more than others uh, as ones that are becoming very relevant to the, the policy analysis of supply chain security. And that's trustworthiness related to uh, where a company is headquartered based on the ability of a foreign government to have undue influence and impact on a supplier based on where it's headquartered and the laws that are in place in that country. If there's not good rule of law, there's no ability for a company to object to commands of the government to challenge those. Uh, if there's no independent judiciary, there's no way for a company to stand up to those. Uh, and if there's no uh, strong legal system, there's no real limitations on the surveillance and military apparatus of the government to influence private actors within a country. So that's become an important, more important element of the analysis of the overall analysis of supply chain security. Uh, the other area that I see emerging more and more is the consideration of 
the company's uh, corporate ethical behavior or non-ethical behavior, uh, as well as transparency related to its ownership. Uh, those at the end of the day are uh, ways, if, if we don't have any confidence in the corporate ownership, the corporate structure, and the ways that the most senior officials in a corporation uh, act when they deal with difficult situations, uh, we can't have confidence in their overall supply chain. Uh, so companies that have a track record of repeatedly stealing intellectual property or repeatedly using bribery and corruption around the world are far less trustworthy than ones that have practice in place to deal with incidents when they might happen and certainly don't make it a corporate effort to benefit from stealing intellectual property and uh, using bribery and corruption. Uh, based on this very multifaceted uh, analysis that needs to occur of any supply chain, including those factors, it's important I also think to think about who is in the best position between the government and the private sector to best help with that analysis. When it comes to the ability for a foreign government to influence a supply chain and looking at the laws in place in that country, the federal government, U.S. federal government, is probably the best place to do that analysis itself. Uh, when it comes to trustworthiness of companies and their ethical behavior, that's, that's something that uh, industry is all the time setting as far as its own standards in that area. So I think there's a combination of, uh, of uh, the private sector and the government and should be weighing in relative to what is what is a trustworthy company, what is what are the best practices uh, as far as uh, corporate governance related to supply and, and to their supply chains. And in the last area of the more technical measures that I that I identified earlier of supply chain security, clearly the private sector has the best, most robust information uh, in, in that area to, to do that analysis of, of their own vendors and the, their, their supply chains themselves and how they want to manage that. Um, we at IT have noticed that you know we've seen a real uh, mul continuing to see a multiplication of the number of efforts related to the supply chain within the federal government uh, to see more agencies involved, but as well to see more executive orders and more processes put in place to get at cyber, get at the supply chain security. Now that's testament to how important supply chain security is, but also means there's not one point of contact for industry to robustly engage. So we urge the federal government to identify an agency that will be the lead uh, supply chain risk management agency, a key point of contact to make that and to allow for more expeditious sharing of information uh, at one focal point. I know that's been attempted in different points in the government at this point, but we really think there needs to be one that stands out. Um, Regarding the ability to share information, uh, there's often a reluctance from the federal government to share with the private sector because of clearance issues. I think we need to continue to work on the, the clearance challenge to clear more individuals in the private sector, just as we can clear uh, a lot of people in the federal government when they're brought on newly onboarded. Uh, closely related to that is the, the, the demand uh, signal that needs to come from the private sector to the government. There needs to be an ability through an appropriate mechanism for the, the private sector to signal what information it needs uh, on cybersecurity generally, but, but specifically on supply chain security to improve that. Uh, the intelligence community, uh, that is the agencies that form the intelligence community, all respond to different uh, agencies and, and other actors as their key customers of their information. The private sector needs to be put in a similar position of being a key customer for the intelligence community and sending demand signals about what it needs as far as uh, inf information so it can be more effective in supply chain security. And the other area that I think it really needs to be addressed is as we've seen more and more software supply chain attacks, this is a, is a more uh, dedicated effort uh, between government and the private sector to get at that. Uh, the techniques, tactics, and procedures being used by adversaries continually evolve to get ahead of where the defenders are. So that needs that information needs to be shared with the private sector as best the government can so that they can stay ahead of uh, efforts to undermine the, the software supply chain and uh, get at, uh, you know, sort of stay ahead of, of where we per perceive the attackers likely to be in the near future. So that robust collaboration is absolutely vital. It, and that, of course, would start hopefully within the United States as we're largely focused on our own policy. 
But I think because supply chains extend globally, it's very important that as the United States establishes policy related to the supply chain, it work very closely with its allies and partners around the world to see them also evolve in the sharing of information that is among governments, but sharing of information also with the private sector in, in various countries around the world. The countries are going to have uh, arrive at understandings about uh, supply chain vulnerabilities in different ways and uh, learn about different threat actors. And so they should be sharing that information among themselves and with the private sector. And then when it comes to establishing standards related to uh, certification or uh, self-attestation, those should be done in ways that seek to harmonize uh, the global approach to this rather than having a fragmented system where each country tends to go its own way. So with that, uh, back to you, Joyce. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I appreciate your comments. Uh, this is a, as they say, this is a, a big hairy monster, um, or as uh, or uh, someone said long time ago, uh, when they had a problem with their email system, there's a gnarly problem. Uh, and so uh, let's let's start with trying to unpack some of these these challenges. So how do you rebuild America's ICT? Uh, competitiveness. What are the right roles for U.S. government and the private sector? And what is the role for international partners? I'll go first. Um, the um, So first, I'd, I'll start with the, the the last part first, which is the role of international partners. And, and I think um, I'm excited about the Biden administration not taking a trend, transactional approach to our alliance and partnerships. And, and as a result, I think we're going to be able to develop a more robust partnership with, with some of these countries going forward. The United States is not going to solve its ICT supply chain problem alone. And if we were to do it, it would be, you know, 20s or 30, you know, billions and billions of dollars and take over a decade. But I think using allies and partners, this is reasonably, you know, a two to three or three to five year problem. Um, you know, you're not going to solve it tomorrow, uh, but you are, you can get yourself on a glide slope to solution over two to three or five years. And I know that sounds like a long time, but that can only be done with allies and partners. And, and we rely on them in so many other ways that, that it's absolutely appropriate here. Now, look, you have to, your allies and partners have to uh, enter a, a level of trustworthiness in their supply mm -hmm. chain. And, and I'll take a good example of Taiwan, an important uh, partner for the United States, one that the Trump administration invested a lot of effort in, in making, uh, you know, providing some strategic clarity to our relationship. And I think went a long way down a, an important path on that. Now it's time to kind of confront the Taiwans and say, look, we know who your security partner choice is, the United States. That also makes us your economic partner choice. It doesn't mean they have to stop doing business with China, but they have to stop doing business in areas that compromise, that could potentially compromise our supply chain. And that's going to be hard. This is a country, I think they're around 30% of trade is with China and probably more around 15% uh, percent with the United States. But also when you add in our allies and partners, that number ex begins to exceed 30%. Um, and so uh, my uh, my other recommendation would be that, uh, you know, that we concentrate on allies and partners like Taiwan, uh, like our, our five eyes countries and attempt to create a, uh, and create a, and a, a strong alliance approach to solving the supply chain issue. And, Great, and that, thank you very much. And if I may just add on to that, I uh, agree with what everything Mark said. Um, you know, one thing we also need to think about is approaching both the basic research level for things like 6G that are coming down the road, as well as on mm -hmm. the commercialization and the application of current technologies, say related to 5G, the need that we're going to have to turn uh, 5G technology and standards into applications that are beneficial to healthcare, to uh, the delivery of electricity, to autonomous vehicles, and to advanced manufacturing. Those are all things that we should be doing with our partners. So as we look to uh, put government money, whether that's the form of grants or tax credits or other tax incentives, into promoting technology, we should make sure that a key effort within all that is to do it with partners. Uh, whether those be other private companies or with research institutions uh, on, in a different country. It's important that uh, that kind of cross collaboration occur and that the uh, the program itself is agnostic and not just seen as something that's seen, set, to, set to subsidize uh, U.S. companies. Uh, 
the broader range of companies are involved in building this technology every day. And there's no reason that the, uh, the research cycle at the more of the front end is not also done in an in international way. Okay, thank you very much. And, and, and Mark, if you need to wave your hands wildly every now and then to make sure that the lights don't go off on you, that's perfectly acceptable. <laughs> I think that was just the Chinese. They were uncomfortable with that last comment. About that one. <laughs> but I think we can move forward now. Okay, great. <laughs> so uh, we're talking about global regulations. So how are global regulations around supply chain security likely to change? And can we do this proactively so that we can have a collaboration with a greater measure of integration and coherence? Uh, maybe if I could start on that one first, Mark, if that's okay with you. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing a kind of a fragmentation in the efforts to regulate supply chain security around the world. Um, the European Union is embarking on a certification scheme pursuant to a cybersecurity law from 2019 uh, that will set up uh, criteria for certification for a number of different uh, uh, technology uh, applications and services. Uh, India has something called the compulsory registration order, which is hitting an increasingly large number of uh, consumer electronic devices. All those efforts uh, occurring in India, in China, in the EU, and in potentially other countries are going to cause a fragmentation of uh, certification schemes for um, the private sector to have to deal with that is maybe develop different supply chains for each of those countries, or even potentially different uh, equipment have to meet different standards for those markets. Uh, it's really important to recognize that certification schemes can play a role, but they only give you a snapshot in time, a one point in time, uh, certainty about what is available, and it just it it addresses a very discrete uh, issue within the overall potential for supply chain compromise, especially when you consider the needs for software updates and the role of software in general in the life cycle of uh, of a technology product. So it's really important that we continue to see the U.S. government and other governments working together to adopt common uh, approaches to supply chain security. Well, you know, it, it, it's interesting when you, when you look at the United States economy uh, and, and you look at the small and medium sized businesses, they are the ones that are supplying a lot of the integral parts and pieces to the large companies, uh, especially in the IoT world. So if you look at the board car, if you do have these small companies that are supplying information and, and technology. To, to the vehicle. So what about a mechanism to support secure ad hoc communication really lacking, particularly for small and medium-sized companies? So I, I'll try first there and I'll say, you know, the, the issue of uh, the um, uh, the information security and supply chain security surrounding the small and medium-sized businesses is a significant one uh, and, and, and challenging because uh, obviously they're not in a position to uh, to you know to foot the bill for their own IT security. You think about some of the major banks in our country, some of whom report that they spend you know around seven hundred seven hundred fifty million dollars a year on on cybersecurity. I mean, you obviously that dwarfs the total budget of a lot of important small and medium sized businesses. Um, so I think two things have to happen. One, we do need to create a more secure environment with managed service providers that meet certain standards. And, and provide a certain level of security. And, and in, in truth, currently many managed service providers, you know, it's it's a it's a cutthroat world out there on the on the cost of the service. And cybersecurity or the security of the data is one of the more expensive elements of the service. And therefore it's a discriminator in cost. So when you get the cheaper service, you tend to lose the security. And so we're very concerned about that. And and uh, the commission's working through how we provide that kind of guidance um, to small, medium-sized businesses. I, and I will say that, um, you know, an, another big element is the idea of, we're starting to recognize that the, uh, you need to be, con the continuous monitoring is the, the key to effective cybersecurity. In other words, internal monitoring for anomalous activity detection, for the, um, you know, for data exfiltration, things like that. Unfortunately, that's also the most expensive element of cybersecurity. So again, very hard for small and medium-sized businesses. 
Um, but one we're trying to encourage and figure out how we can lower the, co the, the cost of entry, particularly for medium-sized businesses in, in that field. The third thing I'd mention is there is still some advantage to static assessment. What I mean by that is there are basic business cyber hygiene steps that have followed in terms of how you implement DMARC, how you implement DNS or DNSSEC, how you do your enterprise registration, you know, these basic steps that if followed properly by your IT administrator uh, in the initial setup of your of your security can establish a higher level of security without significant user interface delay. Um, but you know that takes an attention to detail by the COO, the CEO, and if there is a CISO, the CISO on the IT administrator. And that's increasingly less likely as the company gets smaller. But pushing what those business cyber hygiene skills are is as important as it is for the personal hygiene. I mean, we all know we've got to use multi-factor authentication. We have to use complex passwords. We have to not answer emails from Nigerian princes. You know, we get that in our cyber, <laughs> personal cyber hygiene, but there is an equivalent, you know, 10 or 12 step business cyber hygiene that needs to be followed. And for the for the small businesses, I think that's going to be the key, that kind of static thing. Not as good as the continuous monitoring, not as good as the secure, you know, managed service provider environment, but still critical to the overall security of those companies. Okay, great. Um, Rob, do you have any comments on that one? Nothing to add, that was a very fulsome answer. I don't okay. want to well, <laughs> well, unfortunately, we're out of time already, and I had so many more questions uh, that, that need to be answered, but um, I, we, we will be able to, uh, if there are any questions from our audience, then we can definitely get them to you for uh, responses. So in conclusion, as our dialogue reinforced, there is a significant amount of work to be done in all of these domains, but there is also appetite to deepen this kind of discussion, addressing bite-sized pieces that could be taken into the practical, tactical realm. The process itself has significant value. At the end of the day, the relationships that are developed before a crisis and a shared commitment to joint planning will make a difference between successful defend forward actions and those that adversaries can avoid or defeat. I want to thank Admiral Mark Montgomery and Mr. Robert Strayer for their thought leadership on this spring briefing. You, our online participants, for attending and contributing to the discussion. And of course, our sponsors, Blue Prism, Checkmarks, the Cybersecurity Collaborative, and Finite State for their partnership. As Carol Burnett would say, I'm so glad we had this time together. Let's share and plan ahead. But before you know it, the time is over and it's time for us to say so long. Thank you for your particip participation. Live long and prosper, everyone.